So hello, Mark Buskey. Well, hello, Dirk Point. Okay. <laughs> we are talking today from the Comfort Sugar Kitchen, and since uh, you've allowed me into your home in the middle of the pandemic, we are... I we are now family, my we friend. We are legally family. So I, I wanted to talk to you. Um, you've, been, you've been putting some posts on Facebook, and, and let's go back a little bit. You were my son's middle school music teacher. Yes, sir. And you had a, a great influence on him to the point where he is now majoring in, uh, in music at uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis. And so I've known you for a while. And you've been, you've been kind of putting your, your family history out on Facebook, and, and I've been doing yes, this, this yeah. podcast with yeah. just amazing people. And I thought of you because you have lived your entire life with, I don't know what your technical term, with partial blindness or legal, you know? So, so the legal term is low vision, okay? I'm not legally blind. To be fair, I am legally blind in my left eye. I have... LP in the left eye, meaning I have light perception. The right eye, which has gone through a number of repairs over the years, has low vision, which means it has enough vision to drive. That doesn't make me legally blind. All right? Does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. Okay. Yeah. And so when, um, when did this start? When did you first notice it? Okay, I was born with congenital cataracts, meaning so then I had a cataract on each eye. The left eye's vision has always been low enough that the right eye's vision has canceled out the left eye. All right, so the brain's receiving the images. The right eye's always been stronger, and so it's just, the left eye's never really told my brain what to do. My right eye always has. That's that makes sense? Yeah, I never thought of it, but that makes total sense, uh -huh. right? You, yeah. you're, if you're, it'd be the same thing, but if you, if you close one eye at a time for, for those yeah. people, those are the two healthy eyes. You'll see, you'll see a very different view out of each eye depending on what's going exactly. on. Exactly, and I only see with the right eye. I always have, uh, so there isn't that second view. All right. So it's not that your left eye is completely blind. And maybe it is. It, initially, now. it was yeah. not completely blind. Initially, each eye had a cataract. All right. We normally think of cataracts as being an old person's disease. Congenital is not unusual to be born with cataracts on each eyes, on each eye, but. Um, it's unusual for them to do anything. My cataracts didn't grow until I was 25. So I had glasses in first grade and, you know, corrective lenses all the way through. Or if you really want to think about it and look back at the photos, they were Coke bottle bottoms. They cut out the bottom, put them into frames. Right. Right. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So about 25, I had already finished my high school career and my college career and I started teaching. Uh, and during that year, I, I went through a lot of stress. Um, frankly, the band director I had been working with had been fired. So let me let, let me back that up by saying yeah. I was a high school choir director, and then I was a high school choir director and an elementary school music teacher combined. And then the district said, "We're firing the band director you're working with." No fault to me, of course. All right, I'm going to shut my phone off. Okay. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Yeah, so no fault to, to me, but, but the band director was hired. And they hired me back in as band director and choir director. And I was doing everything. All right, four bands, four choirs, elementary general music. At the high school level? At the high school, well, elementary general, third and fourth grade. Okay. And then high school band, marching band, concert band, jazz band, pep band. Okay. All right. High school choir, concert choir, uh, treble choir, madrigal, and show. By myself. And this is in Illinois this somewhere. This is in right? Illinois. This is Triad High School in Illinois, which is Troy, Illinois. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Stress level went way up. Uh, the congenital cataracts were starting to grow, and over the course of the year, came to the point where I lost my vision in my right eye, my good eye. All righty. I conducted the musical that year, Annie Get Your Gun, from memory. So I'm sitting in the pit conducting. And I had cataract surgery in my right eye and uh, came back and conducted, you know, right at the end of the school year, came back and conducted graduation ceremonies. So you, you had cataract surgery during the school, during, after, the, after musical is over, I guess? Musical closes, I have surgery, I'm flat on my back for a week, okay, because we're talking 30 years ago, right? Flat on my back for a week, 
get back up, go to graduation, conduct graduation, high, the band, and the choir, and then close off my school year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know much about cataracts. I, I, I mean, I know that I've had family member. I mean, it becomes a common thing, like, for most of us yes. as we age, right? Right, right. And it's a pretty common procedure, right, anymore? Yeah, maybe it's very much a, a common procedure now. And even at that point, it was a laser procedure. No, I'm sorry. That one was a scalpel-based surgery. All right. But it was a very easy procedure then compared to the way it was 20 years prior. Okay. Okay. It did mean, though, full rest for half an hour, uh, for a week. Got it? Yeah. So I had cataract surgery in the right eye at 25. Then I had cataract surgery on the left eye at 32, which was my first year to teach over here in Fort Zumwalt. So please in between there, uh, I finished teaching a triad. I went to SIU, went back to SIU to get my master's degree. I taught at the university while doing so. Got another couple of European trips in there. Came over here to start teaching and had another cataract surgery, this time on my left eye. Okay. I was 32. By 39, the, uh, the retina in the left eye detached, so I had to have retinal detachment surgery, you know, we retest the surgery, retest the retina. Oh, I speak for a living and can't do a podcast. Here we go. Um, and that was unsuccessful, so I spent a whole summer on my back to get the retina to reattach and you know, surgery to be successful. It was not. So we did the whole surgery again the following summer. And I spent that whole summer on my back. So that surgery was successful. The retina is reattached. However, the limited vision I had in the left eye was now less. So they thought they'd go in and repair it so I could get at least the small amount of vision I had in the left eye back. Yeah. And they did a repair job and it failed. So then I lost, that's when I went to LP in the left eye. But remember, I still had a contact in the right eye. I could still see mm -hmm. 20, 20 to 20, 30 in the right okay. eye. Great. With glasses, right? With, with a contact lens. Yeah, and okay. Okay. you'd send that, okay. Yeah, and reading glasses over the top so I could reprint. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Right, right. Then glaucoma started to set in on the right eye and they put me on medication and then two and then three. By the time I had Matthew, by the time I had your son at school, I was on five medications a day, different times throughout the day. So we'd go into musical rehearsal after school and I'd have to stop at three o'clock and or the kids would remind me to take my three o'clock drops mm -hmm. to keep the pressures down. Yeah. Beginning of that school year, seven years ago? Thing. Six years ago. It was summer with, with, when, when my son was in school with you? Yeah. Well, he's been graduated for, he's going to his junior year of college now. Okay. So that was six. Oh, yeah. really? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you would have had, he right. would have been in eighth grade seven years ago. Okay. Summer, right, yeah. Okay. So 20, the, the Christmas of 2013, okay, all right, seven years ago, is when they said you can't wait any longer to repair the surgery to repair the right eye, you need to go in for surgery. Mm -hmm. So we finished, let's see, Matthew's, that was a seventh grade year. Okay. Yeah, so we did um, Pinocchio that year, I believe. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, he was the baker, right? Yeah. 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 He was thinking cute. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I went in for surgery. Unfortunately, the surgery wasn't successful. And as I shared with you the last time you and I met, yeah. I then had six further surgeries over the next three months. They put a shunt in my eye to drain the glaucoma. They put a lens in my eye like a contact. And then I was to wear glasses over the top of all of that in order to see. And this is in your good eye. This is in my good eye. Yeah. And my good eye didn't come back fully until almost three years thereafter. Okay. So there's the whole window of, hey, I was born with cataracts. At 25, I had the first cataract removed, 32, the second cataract, and then I've just had small or major procedures pretty much every year. Oh my. Um, until four years ago when they did the final one on this right eye. 
So you, did, had you had any surgeries on your eyes before 25, or was that your very first one? Uh, they did a series of laser surgeries prior to that. Lasers in the 70s and 80s? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, and I was wide awake, and I was able to lie there, and you, know, so you sit there going, okay, hold really still. So, you know, oh, great. Well, we didn't quite make the right spot, going, so we hold really oh, still, no. and I'll look over still a bit. So, yeah, sure. Is it possible those did lasting damage that, that impacted you later? Have you Let's ever... hope not. Okay. Yeah. What are you going to do about Fair it? Fair enough. Right? Yeah. yeah. So let, let's go back a little bit. So, I mean, you probably had somewhere around 50 plus surgeries on your eyes. Well, that's probably fair. Um, so you, you've... You've had the Coke bottle glasses. I, I think I read in your <laughs> that's that's the classic term, right? Yes. Like I think a minor thick, but they're you know they're not even they're not even touching yours. Um, so I remember reading from your stories that maybe the first time you noticed it was trying to see uh, rabbits in the yard <laughs> when you were seven. Is that and those are all true stories? Okay. I don't have to make anything up. Um, nobody would believe it, nonetheless. Yeah. So mom, you know, I grew up on a farm in Illinois. And mom's pointing out out in the field, hey, honey, look at that. Uh, bunny running across. What rabbit, mommy? I don't see a rabbit. Don't you see that running right across? No. And um, then they started realizing, hey, this kid is four or five, and no wonder he doesn't know what's going on. He can't see. Um, so they started taking me in for reviews. And it wasn't until first grade, then like six, when they finally said he's ready for classes. Isn't it interesting before, uh, you mean, you read old stories, like we're talking centuries, and yeah. they would diagnose children as whatever, possessed or whatever. Oh, yeah. It, it's entirely possible they were just maybe couldn't see, couldn't hear. Sure. Whatever, and, and were written off very early. Autistic. Yeah, autistic. It, there's a whole, a whole spectrum. It could be just about anything. I, I have, I've had asthma since I was like a small child. You know, I'm not sure I would have been around if I'd have been alive during those times, so... Um, so you, you went and got glasses about that time, about when you were, what, five, seven, you said, or is that five, six, seven? You know, I, I, look, we are usually five when we're in kindergarten. Yeah. Uh, I was really four and turned five that November. Um, I got glasses sometime during my first grade year and prior to the, uh, pictures, the class pictures. So sometime that fall, right, I would have turned six mm -hmm. in November. Okay. Right? So someplace in there. So you, um, you grew up on a farm. Yes. In Illinois? Like yeah, the, the mailing address for the farm is Alhambra, which okay. is a small town of about 600. Okay. And to be fair, there are two nursing homes in town, so half of the population is in the nursing homes. All right. <laughs> Something where I went to college, there were 13,000 people, but half of it was the college. Oh, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Not, but, so... Um, so you probably went to a small, a small rural school then. Sure, right? I went to Alhambra Elementary. Okay. What kind of challenges did you face for yourself with being in school and I mean not you having trouble reading chalkboards or what was, what was oh, that like? Well, didn't every kid with glasses? We get to sit in the front row, right? Uh, once they identify what's going on, so that you can see the chalkboard. Up to that point, I didn't see the chalkboard. I guess. I mean, I don't. I don't really have no memories of. Kindergarten, sort of. My Mrs. Korsmeyer was very nice to me. <laughs> She's like, "Oh, that dumb busky kid doesn't know anything." <laughs> right, right. He said, "Well, who knew I wasn't seeing anything?" Uh, Mrs. Gentry was very sweet to me, and I got through first grade. Uh, second grade, Mrs. Hoagie was very sweet to me, but not only because I couldn't see, but that was the year I broke my leg. Oh, and I was out of school from Thanksgiving until Valentine's Day. That's a serious break. I broke my hip, I cracked across my left hip, and also knocked my knee out of position. So I was in traction with both legs up in the air initially. Okay, so you can't get away, what, what's, what happened? <laughs> You're right, I can't get away. Yeah, you can't just say All that right. happened. Sure, so okay, so I grew up on a farm, but everybody in my family were farmers. So we're at Uncle Les's, another farmer, and um, Uncle Les worked as a farmer, but also worked uh, for the County of, of Madison County. Mm -hmm. All right. So we had some things on his property that were things that were being thrown away by the county. He didn't steal them. One of them would have been a giant wooden um, spool that, that they used for electrical wire. Sure. Okay. Looks like a giant thimble. Mm -hmm. No, not a thimble, but a, but it doesn't matter. You get the idea. 
Right. Those, it's cool. You see those all? Those used to be just saved by everybody. We'd, yeah, we'd the table on the front patio or yeah, whatever. Well, yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Well, it's a good place to sit where you can put your feet up that are bare and you're playing your banjo. Yep. On the front porch. <laughs> Anyway, so, okay, so we're over at Uncle Les's, and Dad's helping Uncle Les butcher, and Uncle Les loved to have a lot of people over because it was a good opportunity to drink beer as well as butcher. So we kids are all playing together. Good combination. Yeah, of course. And uh, there's a rope hanging in the tree, so I'm trying to climb up, again, I'm a second grader, and I'm trying to climb up onto the spool and grab the rope and Tarzan my way out. Little blind kid. <laughs> Low vision, not blind. All right, <laughs> trying to reach for the rope, and I miss and I fall. You just completely missed the rope. Oh, I totally missed the rope. So you fell off the thimble. Yeah, and which was only like you would say, but like maybe two or three feet off the well, ground. Maybe. It wasn't going to say at least three. Let's make it worthwhile here. But it's like you miss it when you miss a step. Yeah. That you think was there and wasn't yeah, there. Yeah, well, I landed really if well. If you missed like a giant one and and broke, just did you shatter your leg? So I I, I literally cracked all the way across my left hip. Ooh. All right, and I got up and walked partway across the lawn, and then, of course, fell down again, and that shattered it. Now, my parents used the Staunton Hospital system because that was closer to our farm, but we're at Uncle Les's. He's literally 10 minutes from Highland Hospital. Okay. Did my parents take me to Highland Hospital? No. They, they left my sister at the farm with the rest of the people who were butchering. Sure. They put me in the front of the red pickup truck, you know, we had a good old Ford, uh, across my parents' lap, and then proceeded to drive me all the way up Highway 4 to Staunton. And Highway 4 in those days had about mm, six railroads to cross. Oh my goodness. Most of the railroads are now bike yeah, trails. Yeah, yeah. But then, so every time he came, we had to go ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk. And I'm crying in pain. Believe me, I have very clear memories of all of this nonsense. One can imagine. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And then they put me into a body cast, and that's how that whole thing went. And it took you three months out of school? Exactly. Or... So, you know, what was my elementary schooling like? Well, my teachers were very nice to me. Because <laughs> first they thought you were you were, you were picking up what they were putting down. Oh, and exactly. Then they, yeah, all right. So, then they realized I have low vision. Right. And then, they, you know, then they're like, well, and he misses, how many minutes of school? Right. Of course, you know, Mrs. Hogan came to my, she came to the hospital, and she came to the farm to help me catch up, but I never really caught up. And being the youngest kid in the class didn't help anything. Yeah. Now, did you um, did you go through any? You know, kids are cruel. Did you did you have any issues with, with other kids with, oh, with your big profile not. glasses and your and your everybody eyes was and... so sweet. <laughs> um, I mean, adults adults understand. You know, kids. You know. So the diagnosis now is called Stickler's disease, named for Doctor Stickler, who has said. In the womb, sometimes there's not a full formation of all the, f the features we're supposed to have. Okay, I have issues with my eyes. Like you, I have asthma because the nasal cavity is not fully formed. Uh, I still have some of my baby teeth. Let's just put it all out there, folks. You know, there's, there are no secrets left here uh, because the jawline is not fully formed. Hey, you uh, asked, right? Okay. Okay, and this is all because this whole facial feature didn't come out right, if you True. will. I've had no issues with my body from the chin down my whole life. Chin up? Not so much. The money maker isn't using your... Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I have a very full face because the jawline is just full. Now, in our family, we all have full faces. That's another way of saying I have big cheeks. Okay. And as a child, I have really big cheeks. So let's see. Uh, glasses with Coke bottle bottoms in them, you know, and a full, full face. And um, you know, crooked teeth. And, Probably a yeah, tiny guy, right? I was tiny. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know, in my family, we tend to, to be a little. Um, we carry a little guy sometimes. So, oh, the other children were very kind to me. <laughs> sure. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, hmm. so you spent. What? Did you think it's our... <laughs> no, I'm just thinking, Doctor, I should be lying down for this session on my back. Yeah, well, there you go. Go through my psyche here. I need a notepad <laughs> or something. Well. Uh, I didn't... <laughs> so, you taught, um, you taught music your entire career. Right? Yes. Somewhere around 30 years, was that? Yeah, uh, I started in 1986 um, and got... 
to be fair, 29 and a half years in, in total. Okay. All right. Because my first teaching experience was really a half year, um, and then I was full time thereafter. Okay. And you're talking, it sounds like you're talking anywhere from elementary all the way to high school. Right. Uh, right. Plus a little bit of that collegiate teaching on top of it. Okay. A little part time at SIU, a little part time at Lewis and Clark Community College, well, well over in uh, Illinois, while living here in Missouri. Okay. But then the majority here, while you've been in Missouri, of 20 years or so. I was here for Fort Zumo for 21 years. And that was all middle school slash junior high? Uh, actually, I was at Fort Zumo North High School my first year here. Okay. And then I switched to middle school thereafter and stayed at South Middle for 20 years. Okay. When did you first start to, when did your love for music start to uncover itself? My dad loved to sing. He loved to play instruments. He was completely self-taught. He played what some people nowadays would call a squeeze box, an accordion. It's a but the a Who push song, right? Hmm? The Who song. I've never heard it called that. Mom, Daddy plays a squeeze box and... Mom plays a squeeze box. Daddy loves to sleep at night. You've lost me, but I believe you. Really? Okay. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, the, you know, the 1950s Lady of Spain accordion had piano keys. That's not what my father played. He played a push button accordion. I keep pushing, you know. Sure, um, sure. But that's sure. the kind of that he had. Um, he, he liked to play harmonica, okay. Uh, <laughs> he liked to entertain people, and he did his whole life. Good grief. And then, you know, the man ran a farm with a hundred head of hogs and cattle and sheep and horses and chickens and all of that. He drove a, a truck, which was an oil spreader, so that was seasonal work to make enough money to keep the farm going. He clerked for auctioneers all of his life. Um, he sold insurance part-time. I often joke I didn't see him until I was 11, yeah. you know. And then he would entertain people at dances with his music. Uh, so I, I grew up with a lot of singing and, and just a lot of music in the home. Um, country music, of course. That's what I was going to say, okay, yeah. Country music, which I know some people think is an oxymoron. But this is like, you, you'd be talking classical, Hoot and holler on country music, right? Oh, Gene Autry. Okay, okay. yeah. So yodeling. Oh, not yodeling. No, <laughs> didn't, no, no. didn't Gene Autry yodel no, no, no. a little bit? Yes, okay. of course. Not, not, a, not more, a. More, more likely, um, what? Joe Stafford, Jim, okay. Jim Reeves. What a glorious voice Jim Reeves had. Uh, the, the classic, really fine singers in the country world uh, of the the fifties and sixties and very early seventies. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, you got your love of music from your dad. Sure. Um, we'll skip ahead. You go off to college. Yes. In Illinois. Did you have a major when you started? I, I kind of know where this story goes, but did you have a major when you started? or? So you... I, I played in band from fourth grade all the way through high school. I sang in choir from middle school all the way through high school. Uh, I declared a music education major at SIU Edwardsville my first year of school, and I never looked back mostly because there was nothing else I could do for a living. My mother threatened to make me dig ditches for a living because, you know, there was, like, I had no other skill. So I, I thought pretty much I could teach. Sounds yeah. like a mother, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what I yeah. <laughs> Very, 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 very loving, yeah. very, very thoughtful. Yeah, you know, where would we be, where would we be without her? <laughs> yeah. So what, uh, what instrument did you play in the band? I was a percussionist in the band. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you, you get into college, so, so you're, yeah. you declared music, Yes. but like a lot of schools, like they're, you declare the music, you do it for a couple of years, then you have to get into the music school, right? Right. So you, you're officially in the music school from the beginning, but um, in, in those days and in most schools even today, you have to go through what's then called a sixth quarter jury. I'm sure there are other names for it now, but about halfway through your, your school years, so the end of your sophomore year, you go through a jury where you perform a set of music, for your instructors, and they decide if you're going to move on, period. Or if they're going to say, we're really sorry, nice, but you don't have enough talent to really complete the major here at our school, maybe you need to go do some remedial work or become an insurance salesman, okay? Good luck to you. And yeah, so I got to that six quarter jury, and I was very excited about that because I knew this was a big deal, and I had a voice teacher who was very, <laughs> kind of like uh, Mrs. Gentry and Mrs. Hoagie back in elementary school. She was very nice to me, okay? But she didn't necessarily think I had any talent. In fact, she was very blunt <laughs> and told me, 
you know, you're maybe the greenest singer I've ever had. Uh, so she was determined to not pass me. But I also had a choral director who I also was uh, the secretary for, for the music department, right? Dr. Van Kemp uh, saw in me some talent to teach. I don't know that he thought I was his best musician, but he did feel like I was his best education candidate. Right. So he was really pulling for me. I walked in, I sang my first piece, In Quelliani, which is an aria from a Mozart opera. And Leonard smiled and Sarah frowned and she wrote on her paper and he wrote on his paper and he came down to the office where I was working for him afterwards and said, you passed. Because I told, I told the, your voice instructor that I really felt you needed to. She has since come back to me saying, I think I, I, I didn't see in you what he saw in you, but I see it in you now. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe I owe you a slight apology. Good. So, yeah. It's interesting how we have Part of the frame, we all have blind spots, right? Yeah, oh, no kidding. Yeah, if you're, if you're, I, I have this phrase that I haven't talked about, but uh, I think we're all a snob about something. And so, <laughs> true, you know, like, I, I'm kind of a Star Wars snob, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, like, if you, if you don't know a certain thing about Star Wars, I might correct you, and you're like, okay, who cares, really? But to me, it's important, right? So maybe to, to your music professor, who, the one who, Yes. Said your voice was green, that's kind way of oh, yes. saying you yes. don't like your voice, right? Um, to her, the, the music was the most important thing. Um, but your other professor, you were secretary, realized that you could be a great educator um, because of your passion for it and, and maybe just your skill as an educator. And he also knew there was nothing else I could do for a living. I'm teasing. Yeah, I was <laughs> so I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, Leonard, Leonard was very, Dr. Leonard Van Camp was, he was very, very kind to me. He, um, you know, he really did see potential in me as a teacher, and he uh, allowed me to work for him, which is another way of saying I killed myself for three years, uh, being the secretary for the whole choral department at SIU, but I loved it. Uh, I got to travel to Europe with him in 1985 with the concert chorale, three weeks in Europe, a week in Israel, a couple days in New York, singing for Pope John Paul, and just glorious. Um, after I started teaching the triad, I got to go back and perform with Leonard again in the chorale as an alumni in 19, 1989. So then we did a tour of Central Europe. We went behind the Iron Curtain. What year was this? 1989. So right before or after? Right before the fall. Oh wow. The rest of the Berlin Wall. So we're, we're in East Germany that summer and we're listening to our guides say, you are so lucky because you understand what freedom is, we never will. This is never going to change. And in November of that very year, Mr. Gorbachev, take, tear down this wall, right, is what President Reagan said back in those days. And lo and behold, the wall came down in Berlin. Yeah. I remember very clearly because I was giving my fall concert at the high school, and I got home and my dear friend Julie called me, who had also been on the trip, and had said, have you seen the news? No, turn it on. And we watched the news over the phone together. And you had just been there. I mean, yeah, yeah, just a few months before. So, so you say you went, so was East Germany the only place you went then? or did you... No, no, no. That, that particular trip, we were through Central Europe. So the first trip, it was mostly Southern Europe and Israel, Jordan. Okay. Uh, and then the second trip was mostly Central Europe and into behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany. The third trip was into Russia. So we actually did concerts in New York, and then in Moscow, and in Leningrad. And that was only 1991, so the world was very new uh, in you know, this whole idea of a, a cultural exchange between Russia and the United States. Um, and we were very leery of these people called Russians, because we had been taught not to like them, yeah. and they had been taught not to like us. And what we discovered as a choir is that we were all just people. And we had a glorious time. Our governments, maybe at the time, were not so friendly, but man, it's just people. It was wonderful. I, I like what you said there. I think that uh, I have this great, I have this great hope for my my kids and future generations that you know they play these, they play games online, and you're on chats online, and you're yeah. talking to people from, and playing games with people from everywhere. Um, and if we can just see more that people were all, every person on earth just wants to take care of them, themselves and their family. Right. Um, and, and beyond that, there's really not much more. In, and there, there are exceptions, 
you know, but sure, the oh, great sure. vast majority of us, that is the goal. And the more we realize that, hopefully over time, you know. But anyway, so oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so you mentioned what, what was your professor's name? His name was Dr. Leonard Van Camp. Okay, and you had mentioned to me before that he was a, a significant influence on your life. Absolutely, and... I got to have Leonard near the end of his uh, very illustrious career. He and a lot of other very fine musicians were hired to start the music department at SIU when SIU opened in 1964, which is a very good year by the way. That's the year I was born. My father, spreading oil uh, with that oil spreader, actually built some of the roads on the campus okay. during those, those early years. Um, so Leonard was, you know, in the early 80s, he had been there for 20 years already. He had built this amazing choir program. They had won first in world competition. They had won third in world competition. They were featured on the radio, uh, in different radio shows. Uh, he had been judging all around the world for choral competitions. And here I am, this very green tenor, coming from a hog farm, right, uh, in, in little central Illinois, and, and coming over to, to come sing with him. Um, he took me under his wing. He taught me everything I you know, was learning during those times. I applied all of that in my classroom teaching high school. Uh, I, I fell back to those skills even when I suddenly became a high school band director, something I maybe had no business doing, but we did the best we knew how, and we made some awfully good music. The good thing is I have really good kids. And then he stepped out of his teaching career to do his last sabbatical in 1980, no, you know what, 96, I think, 95, someplace in there. And he asked me to come back and take over his courses for him, which I thought was a very sweet compliment because he felt like I would run his program the way he would have run his program. Um, it was second nature to me to just keep it going, not come in and try to put my own stamp on it. So I suddenly was directing the SIUE Concert Chorale. I got to direct the university singers. I got to take the kids on tour. Um, I got to present at the Illinois Collegiate Choral Festival as this, you know, stand-in for Leonard Van Camp. Suddenly, instead of 5'8", I was 6'2". Suddenly, instead of reasonably hairy, which is not true anymore, I had a bald head, just like Leonard, um, and uh, tried to conduct as he had done. Um, it was a wonderful compliment. And when he passed uh, 17 years ago now, uh, the family was kind enough to ask me to be a pallbearer and also to conduct the choir at his funeral. So there are 300 people standing all around this church three and four deep, and I'm getting to stand in the center of the church and conduct one of his favorite arrangements of the American folk song, Shenandoah. Oh, wow. It still brings, I've got, I've got goosebumps right now. Uh, it just brings tears to my eyes uh, to get to honor him in that manner. Um, yeah, so I mean, both my father was a huge influence on me through my life, and, and Leonard was absolutely the second father figure to me. Yeah, it's always, some, I think it's, by the way, I keep looking at the camera because we're recording. Yeah, I'm not used to this yeah. live recording, I'm just checking the time up there. Sure, and, and I keep looking over going, what's he looking at? Because from here, <laughs> and we're only talking, you know. You see a couple blue shirts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. So, so you were, you were traveling, you were traveling from here to Edwardsville, like on a daily basis for a while then? Or yeah, you? um. It, from the farm to SIU was 17 miles cross country. Okay. Okay. And I lived at home throughout my bachelor's degree and helped my father take care of the 100 head of hogs and the, the, the cattle and the, the whole business uh -huh. uh, while going to school. Um, my parents were kind enough to pay for my education for the first two years. I paid for the rest of it. Uh, the trade off was that I would stay at home and take care of the stock uh, and I would still pay rent. Right, um, kids today don't know how lucky they have it. Uh, it was a good trade-off, though, because I meant I, I was able to take very few student loans and um, kind of work my way through school mm -hmm. because I was given a grad assistantship, a grad assistantship uh, at SIU. I didn't have to pay for my masters, and they paid me a whopping three hundred dollars a month, which almost paid my rent for my apartment. Okay, my yeah, rent right. for my apartment was 310. Yeah. Okay. 
so you know that was a nice trade-off as well. And I was living in Troy, Illinois, so I only had a 15-minute commute to the university. So have you always been able to drive this whole this whole time, or how has how's your transportation worked? So you know I've never had a long commute. Uh, even working here in Sumwalt, I am two miles and a tenth from South, from South Middle School. Um, yeah, so it's never been a, you know, a big deal for me to drive. 2040 is what every American needs to have in order to have a driver's license. Mm -hmm. And you only need that in one eye. In Florida, by the way, you need 2050 in one eye because we have an older community there. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. so they had, they've changed the law slightly to help accommodate those people. Uh, throughout all of this process with the cataract surgeries, the retina reattachment surgeries, the surgery where they put a shunt into my eye, I still had 20, 20 to 2040 to work with. Granted, the day after the surgery I didn't, but you know, once the surgeries uh, were complete mm -hmm. and the healing process was complete, I was able to get back to driving. Um, there was a period of time during the last seven surgeries over the three months in 2013 and 2014 where it was much more difficult for me and my friends at, at South Middle School to roll me to work mm -hmm. and brought me home every single day. And thank goodness for them because there was never a moment when they said, well, you know, good luck to you. They just said, well, sure, we'll pick you up on the way in. Yeah. And you mentioned at one point um, before one of your surgeries, yeah. the glaucoma, yes. that you were you were conducting in the pit for, I can't remember, what was musical? And you get your gun. And you get your gun. Yeah. Um, by, by memory. Yes. Oh, yeah. So were there any other, like, what, were there daily challenges or any other challenges that presented themselves? When Matthew was coming through, and, and for a number of years, there, well, all the years thereafter, choir programmers at SCU, excuse me, choir program at South Middle School was blessed with kids who loved to sing and they kept attracting more kids. And the drama program kept bringing in more kids. So we were running 160, 170. When I left the program at South Middle School, it was 214. Biggest challenge I had was 45 faces in front of me yeah. are just 45 blurs, okay? Distance, long distance vision during that actually was quite good. Close up for me wasn't too bad, but the distance between me and the kids in the choir of that 15 feet, that level, no matter what we did with the classes and the implant, we couldn't get it to get a clear vision, okay? So I couldn't see the faces. The district understood that and they gave me a classroom aid. And that aid stayed there for those full three years. Now, to give you a really clear vision, you and I are sitting across the kitchen table from one another. We have an overhead light on right now. Yeah. And there are a couple of lamps behind you that are at head level. So I see your blue shirt, okay? I see your face, but the upper uh, right-hand quadrant, so as, as you're looking at me, your upper left-hand quadrant, is not completely clear. It's mostly a set of dots that are flashing at me. Imagine looking through bubble wrap and having some of the bubbles be clear, but the edge of each of the bubbles be slightly fuzzy. And then imagine the bubble up in the right-hand corner being a blinking light at you all the time, where that picture is simply never still. So right now the lights are, is that just because of the lights then? It's, or it's because of the lighting, okay? okay? Overhead lighting is very difficult for me. Then you try things like neon, which is what we have in a classroom, mm -hmm. or in, Fluorescent lighting. Or right, fluorescent or... lighting. In any big box store. I live on my own. I have a valid driver's license that I just passed again last fall. Uh, so I'm very fortunate. I'm not a fool. I don't go driving any place in the world. I don't go on the interstate. But I can take care of myself locally. When I'm in a grocery store, I have to focus and concentrate to my absolute most because that overhead lighting is making everything blurry. Now we're living through a pandemic, so I'm wearing a mask, and you and I both wear glasses. I'm wearing a pair of glasses over the mask as best I can. They're fogging up. We're all a little nervous in the setting as well, right? And sometimes grocery stores and Walmarts and places like that 
move things. Welcome to my nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something I don't think about because, I mean, I, I've got, I don't have great vision, but I mean, you put glasses on, I'm, I can see everything 20 20 with my glasses. Sure. It's not an issue. So, yeah, just, just moving something to a different aisle or change. I think you mentioned last time changing up the way you walk, you, you traverse to and through the checkout lanes. Right. Because they've all, all stores have done that. Like, you can't just walk up. Now they've got like lanes built and blue and stickers. And they change the floor. them every blessed week. <laughs> So, and you know, we're all going to the store as little as we can, uh -huh. but, um, I, you know, I just, I guess I could learn to order everything online, but then I've got to deal with other computer screens and other things that are a challenge for me. So it's, it's easier for me to go ahead and go into the store mm -hmm. and keep my normal routine going on. But when you keep changing things on me, yeah. that makes it harder. And here's a little sidebar to all that. Um, Wentzville Christian Church put on a wonderful musical uh, last Christmas. It was uh, a Christmas carol, a 1940s radio hour live radio show. Okay? Yeah. And they cast me in the show. I had a ball, but I couldn't see on stage, well, the stage lighting in my face, where to go on stage. So I memorized how far it was up to the mic in the radio play and then back to where I was sitting or wherever I was crossing to be in the next scene. Or I played piano in about a third of the show. I memorized the whole score that I had to play and then would know it was 15 steps to the mic number four and then back to the piano and turn around and begin to play whatever song I was playing next. That's not because I'm some stinking genius. It's just because that's what I have to do to manipulate the world I live in. So when you talk about, so 15 steps to the mic yeah, and you've got the stage lights and, and I've been on stage, um, yeah. you know, they're blaring because the audience is dark and there's lights just, just directly in your face. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, is was it, is it 15 steps and as you're approaching the mic you start to be able to make out that it's there, or is it 15 steps and you reach out and hopefully you grab something or you, or you're hoping it's there? Uh, it's four. It's steps 13. You know, 14, yeah. 15, and then ah, there's the mic. Okay. All right. Yeah. But, you know, it's radio play. There were four different mics and we all played a number of characters. And so we had lots of different voices for each of the characters. Uh, I got to be uh, not only young Scrooge, but I was the little boy who sat on Santa's lap and wanted a large screen TV, an RCA Victor television set, you know, a 13 inch screen. Yeah. Right? Uh, in one of the commercials in, in the show. Well, that's a hoot, that's a lot of fun. But that meant that I had to be in a different spot and use a different voice. And it all without my glasses on, on top of it because these glasses don't fit. 1947. So they went for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So did you do like uh, radio sound effects where you're clapping two bricks together or two pieces of wood? Well, you know, in the old radio shows, which is kind of what a podcast is today on some level, mm -hmm. right? There was usually one sound guy who had a table and he had footprints and he had door slams and he had the chains for uh, the ghost scene and so, and so on and things like Scrooge. So there was one guy who did all of that. Awesome. And we did the background noises as well as, of course, all the characters' voices. It was a hot, it was a hoot. Yeah, I love that story. It's it's um, aside from the Christmas story itself, I think it's just it's easily the greatest Christmas story. Oh, know? absolutely! It's retold in so many different ways. It's it's constantly around you, and you can see it. And just anyway, yeah, yeah. it's it's the man who invented Christmas. The way we celebrate yeah. all of the traditions that are not within the church setting. You know, it's all, it all comes back to that yeah, you're right. Victorian era. Way to go. Yeah. Oh, my. Charles Dickens. Oh, my gosh. My brain was, a, I was thinking Charles Darwin. I'm like, I know he didn't write it. He, he may have uh, started it from, anyway. So, so your biggest challenges vision-wise came later in your career, it sounds like. You know, initially things were hard because I still had those Coke bottle bottom classes, right? Uh, at age 20, and I'm, and I'm barely 22 uh, coming into the classroom, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm dealing with this. But again, I had great kids at Try and I, uh, and we did full scale musicals, and then I had 300 third and fourth grade rats, and we did full scale musicals with all 300 of the kids in the elementary all the same time, and I had the band program. But the bigger issues really did happen during the last, especially the last three years, mm -hmm. because I had surgery in 2013, 
and then 2013, 14, 14, 15, and 15, 16 year, if I didn't have somebody just helping with the overall vision in the room, I, I wouldn't have been able to do my job. Mm -hmm. I, I stopped, didn't stop being a musician. I didn't stop caring about kids, but I could not do physically some of the things the job required. And you know, I don't like to say that out loud because it makes me feel like, oh, well, then they have grounds to. Um, I was honest with the district from the get-go, and they were honest with me. They gave me someone who could help me out, and yeah. everything was fine. I don't think it's that uncommon. I know that the high school choir has a, an assistant just because of the size of the classes are sure. 100 kids, you know? Right, right. Well, and, you know, and again, I was looking at 150, 170, 180, yeah. and the 200. They weren't giving me an assistant because of the numbers. They were giving me an assistant because of my vision. Yeah. Um, I'm glad the high school choir has an assistant because I think, you know, Jason's been running 150 to 180 kids. Uh, for quite a while there at the high school as well. Um, he needs somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, <clears throat> tell me about some of the trips you took. So you're taking all these trips to foreign places. Yes. Um, what is that like? What, I mean, is, is does that produce any challenges for vision-wise? I mean, I, I, I know that just you dropped me into, I guess we'll say Germany, and you're, 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 German, German background is it? Yeah, ich yeah. spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Yeah, ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch auch. Oh. Yeah, um, we speak a little German. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> a little, very little. I bisschen. Yeah, ich studiere Deutsch in Gymnasium in 1982. Yeah, ich habe, ich habe, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So I studied German in high school back in 1982, right? Yeah. Which is also when you did a little. I studied high school. I, I, I took three or four classes in, in college to the point that I was actually looking at maybe doing a minor. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't do it. Um, and, I, and I have, okay, so I have a bachelor's degree, K through 12, instrumental and vocal music in Illinois at the time, and it may still be true, voice people needed to have German and French and Italian as part of their background. And then you picked one of those to do a full year of college language. So I chose German. Yep. And then we traveled in Austria and Switzerland and Germany in 85. We went back to Germany and Switzerland in 89. We were in Russia where they didn't speak a lot of English, but I found people who spoke German. Oh, really? And so I was able to communicate with them in German as a second language, which let me tell you, was that was interesting, but we got through it. you know. Um, and so I was able to use my German then. We sponsored uh, exchange kids at the high school, still when I was teaching in Illinois. The German principal from the high school in Bremen, Germany, stayed with me. Oh. And he stayed with me because I could speak a little German and he spoke almost no English. So for what, two or three weeks, I think three, he slept uh, in my bedroom, I slept you know, on my couch in the living room, and we spoke in German. Yeah, until you get immersed in it, you're not going to learn it. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then, you're right, I've been lucky enough, we went back to Europe in 1999. I was the associate conductor of the group that year, so I'm again with Van Camp and the Concert Chorale alumni and getting to conduct a little bit as well as is getting to travel. And we're back through Central Europe. And things have really changed in 99 compared to way back in 85. Then all these surgeries were facing me. So I had a circle of friends here in Missouri who said, you've always talked about going to England and Ireland and Scotland and Wales. Let's go before you lose your vision because there's a chance you know, these surgeries may go, mm -hmm. you know. So we went to England and Ireland and Scotland and Wales. And then we said, hey, that was fun. Let's go back to Italy and Greece and Turkey. So we did that. And then one of my friends said, I've always wanted to see Hawaii, and we went to Hawaii together, just she and I, and we met some folks over there. Um, and we kept hearing people say, you know, when we get back to the States, you're in the States, guys, this is Hawaii. <laughs> you're not in Europe. <laughs> it's funny, though, it's so far oh, away. Yeah. But it's, well, it's a different, you know, it's, yeah. really, it's American culture, but it's also a very different culture. Yeah. Uh, so we got to see Hawaii. And then, uh, you know, after the surgeries were complete, and I finally, almost two years after, and almost finally gotten back to normal, still another full year until I'd gotten back to regular vision again in the right eye. Hey, you want to go to Alaska together? Sure. So a group of friends went to Alaska. Um, yeah, yeah. I've been, 
I'm 20 countries in so mm -hmm. far, and I hope I'm to a point now as a retired guy that someone's willing to go with me. It's a little harder now. Yeah, I mean, for the yeah. next year or so. It's harder because harder. of the pandemic. Yeah. It's harder because my vision level is different now. Uh, it's harder now because lighting really can throw me. Going up a staircase, not a, not a problem. Going down a staircase can be hmm. really difficult for me, something that's simple. Um, so I, you know, I'm hoping I have a couple of friends who are willing to say, I would be happy to go with you to wherever. Uh, but, you know, I understand you've got an issue that I may need to help you with a little bit. Yeah. So you want to go? Yeah. We had trips planned to Madrid. Um, just to get briefly into, into my yeah. life here. Yeah. yeah so my, uh, Matthew's twin brother, Justin, was in Madrid um, for studying abroad. Yeah. And so we were planning to go there, I think, March 10th or 11th, something like that. But he ended up coming home on the 13th. <laughs> so, uh, so we... <laughs> We kept holding out hope and holding out, you know, we were, we, nobody knew how this pandemic was working until about mid-March is when we all, mm -hmm. that's when we really started reacting to it, you know. Right. And I don't think we were responding, we were reacting. Um, and maybe a week or two before that, I, I realized we are going to be taking that trip and it took my wife a little bit longer and, you know, so we've got these airline credits now and they're good for, a, I think, through like mid-2022, so we're okay. You know, a lot of time. Hopefully, uh, if not, we've got other things going on. But um, so yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe after this is all over, sometime mid next year, we're gonna be looking to go somewhere. Because we've even looked going domestically. Because we 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 looked at going to Alaska. But if you go to Alaska now, you get quarantined for two weeks. Right. So I don't want to. I don't want to spend my whole trip in a. a a locker in the airport or whatever they're doing. <laughs> I don't know where they're putting me. It's just like being back at your mother-in-law's. Yeah. Right. <laughs> No, it won't. <coughs> that was a pleasant opportunity it was. to stay with your mother-in-law's house. We did fine. <laughs> and for those who don't know, I stayed at my mother-in-law's house at the beginning. Uh -huh. uh, when Justin came home from Madrid, he had to quarantine for 14 days in yes. our house. Yes. And with my asthma, my doctor advised me not to be in the house, so I went to my mother-in-law's house for three weeks. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> we get along fine. We do, we do fine. Oh, yeah. Um, so what what are your you've been you've been having these? It seems like the surgeries have been, have been ramping up as time goes on. Sure. What's your what's your prognosis, or do you know, or are you just taking it day by day? Uh, I, well, I take everything day by day nowadays. Um, I hope that we all do at this point. We're not promised tomorrow after all. But um, you know, the prognosis right now is if we can keep the glaucoma pressure steady, this could be something good for the rest of my life. It has been reasonably steady for the last six months. For the year prior to that, we were changing meds once again. It was no drops, then it was one drop, then it was two. Um, right now, I'm simply on uh, one to just keep any kind of infection out and one to keep the glaucoma pressure a little lower than that little shunt in there. Is doing so. You know, imagine there's a tiny straw inside my eye, if you will. It's actually in my eyelid, and it drains the liquid form of glaucoma at all times, which drains it out of the tear duct. There are two forms: there's a dry form and a liquid. I have the liquid form. If it is running just right, the pressure is down. If the fluid level isn't running at the right level, of course, you know then that's when the pressures either go up too high or they go down too much. What they did in the initial surgery was to put in the shunt and drop a lens in, an implant lens, just like you would normally get with cataract surgery, something they didn't do for me the first time around back at 25. What they did in surgeries two, three, four, five, six, and seven is to go in with a laser and try to cut the little ties with a laser or go back in with a scalpel and tie it back in tighter, to put it in layman's terms, mm -hmm. okay? So, first surgery, put in the shunt, put in the lens, I'm asleep. Second surgery, the next day, try to take care of the little ties with a scalpel surgery, I'm asleep. Third surgery, which happens to be the next day again, so December 18th, 19th, now we're at the 20th, I'm wide awake. It's a four hour procedure. They're using hand tools, they numb the eye 
Uh huh. That's the reaction most people get. Ooh, I'm uncomfortable. Uh huh. And um, you know, he's saying, "Now, Mr. Busky, this is a feather knife. And if you feel any incision, please let me know." And he would go in and make a little cut. I didn't feel anything, and because my vision was so low at that moment, I really didn't see anything. But I sat there upright as best I could, holding everything still. Yeah. Surgery four, five, and six were mostly laser surgeries, but I, again, I was put out for one and awake for the next two. The last one was fine on my back. It was a scalpel-based surgery, but I was wide awake. It was an hour and 10 minutes, and it was literally me lying on my back, looking up at me into this bright light, and the doctor saying, move your head slightly to the right. Now look up a little further, Hold it right there. You're doing great. You're doing great. Okay, now look over slightly to your left. A little bit more. Down. You're doing great. So tell me about your choir program, Mr. Busky. But it, 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 and he's just, you know. Did they have your eye like propped open so you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So how do you? How does the eye stay like still? M well, still or moist? I guess I don't. That's the word, right? <laughs> <laughs> and now the whole audience is kind of uncomfortable, too. Yeah, you're sticking things in your eyes, your eyes are moist, yes. The, the audience would be now, let's see, two family members who are listening. And, um, anyway, um, look, they had already done a series of injections around the eye to make sure I didn't feel anything, uh -huh. right? I felt the injections, by the way. So you really trust a man once he sticks a needle in your eye. Okay. Um, there are a series of warm moist claws that are covering the rest of my face. Okay. Plus this clamp, if you will, holding open my holding my eye open. It sounds like a torture chamber. You know, I had <laughs> all of these procedures were done at Southern no, I'm sorry, all these procedures were done at St. Louis University Eye Institute. Yeah. I had the head of the department who typically talks to the team starts the surgery with the team, leaves to work with another patient. I learned later through the head intern at the time that my doctor stayed with me through the entire procedure, every procedure I had. He was that concerned so that he, he stayed with me right to the very end. In fact, on that particular seventh surgery, he sat with me in the recovery room, okay, all but held my hand so kind yeah because when i came out of it you know they're, they're wanting to see how much i can see well that bright light in your eye for an hour and 10 minute procedure causes you know it, the, the eye you can't just come right back it's kind of like walking into a very dark room and you have to adjust well this was a very long adjustment and it took longer for me to adjust than he was anticipating so he literally sat beside me on my right because i couldn't see him if he sat on my left and <laughs> Just kept saying, okay, it's going to be fine. You know, what can you see now? Well, I sort of see light. Great. Can you see a whole picture of light or only small spots? Whole picture. That's good. That's really good. And we talk a little bit more. And I've known this man for 10 years. So he was talking to me about the musicals and, you know, what's going on with the choir kids right now. And, you know, where have you been on tour lately and with the kids and that kind of thing. He's, he's a musician himself yeah. as well as a doctor. So, you know, we have this in common. Um, yeah, and just to give you a little more window into, a little more window into my soul. Yes, please. As you're talking about seeing a, a light blur or a spotty blur, mm -hmm. all I can think of, not all I can think of, but my mind goes to Return of the Jedi. <laughs> of course it does. Because because uh, Han Solo is is encased in carbonite uh -huh. at the end of Empire Strikes Back, and he's got the like, you know what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And when he comes out... I have seen the movie once. Okay. So when he comes out, he has... Literally, they call it space blindness. Yeah. Right. So they're out uh, on a skiff going along Tatooine to go to the pit, the pit where they're going to throw him in. Yeah, yeah, digest yeah. over a thousand years. And <laughs> Luke says, you see anything? He's going, I don't know. Instead of a big dark blur, I see a big light blur. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I... What else? What is there anything you you uh, that you come across that that you're interested to share, or you could tell somebody that can encourage somebody who maybe has a similar situation, or 
You know, look, um, so I worked with St. Louis Society for the Blind last summer. It took me a few years to just sort of get used to the idea of being retired from teaching and being away from kids and being away from that level of creativity and finding something new to take its place. And then it was time to say, it's time to help myself, right, with with my vision level and let's figure out what's going on. So I, I met uh, the doctor, the eye doctor at St. Louis Society for the Blind, who gave me some pointers and then helped me through a three month session with other people like me. And there's my piece of advice, find other people like you, you know, find your peeps. Because listening to people my own age, people who are older, people who are younger, by quite a few years, all going through the same situation, even though we come at it from different angles. Some of us from cataract surgery, some from glaucoma, some from odd diseases, some from accidents that have occurred, some having to give up their doctor's practice because they couldn't see well enough to work with patients any longer and just having an aid wasn't gonna do it, all right? Some of them giving up teaching. That was, the, that was an eye opener, if you will, for me because I met other people who were going through the same boat and we have become friends. And I check in with some of these folks you know every week, how are you doing? What else have you discovered to use technology wise that I should probably check into, all right? What else have you found just in daily living that, um, you know, that, that I should probably look into or you know, that you really enjoy? Um, because we do see the world in a very different manner. I met a gal through church who has my same vision level and also left classroom teaching because of her loss of vision. And I tell you what, we were talking and she said, okay, when you get in a car at night, even though you trust the person who's driving, because neither one of us can drive at night, okay, do you kind of freak out because you don't know where you are? Yes, she grabbed my arm. She's like, oh my God, I have not been able to express that feeling to my husband for the last five or six years. And she said, I trust him implicitly, but I feel like I'm just going through this empty space. And so I don't know what's going on and I've become a nervous wreck. And I don't know how to relax and then just enjoy the ride, if you will. And I didn't think anybody else was having the same experience. Oh honey, yes I am, yeah. Um, so I would say to anybody who's going through anything, vision loss, hearing loss, loss of a loved one, you're, you're grieving, find somebody who's also going through it and make them your best buddy. So do you think that's something that's that's you are ready for at this point of your life or do you think it's something that you could have really used along the way? I could have used that along the way. Yeah. And I probably needed it along the way. But you know, you and I know each other well enough to know between surgery three and four, I lost my dad. He had a massive heart attack on New Year's Day. We didn't see it coming. Granted, the man was 81 and a half. You know, he wasn't a kid anymore. But we'd had lunch that day here in St. Peter's. He drove back to Illinois with my mom and my sister. He was gone that night. And then I'm facing surgeries four, five, six, and seven. Mm -hmm. And I'm facing moving my mom off our family farm and selling my father's collection from all those things he bought with all those auctioneers he worked for and having a very different world. Then I'm facing having to step out of my classroom and retire earlier than I planned on. And then, you know, this year we lose my mom on New Year's Day. I would have loved to have had somebody through that whole process to literally hold on to. Mm -hmm. And I didn't through all of it, but I do now. And I, you know, I'm a man of faith and I rely on, on God. Um, and, and that's a spiritual thing, but I also believe we have to have somebody else in our lives who can help that physical thing, if you will. And we're in a pandemic and I live by myself. It's pretty hard to have a hug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when you're distancing from six foot. And I'm not gonna hug you, so. It's you not know, personal. It's you know. I, and I'm disappointed, but I'll look at it. <laughs> I'll hug you maybe, maybe in 2021. I'll there you go. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> well, I uh, thanks for taking your time, and I, I really appreciate you allowing me in your home. Um, you know, uh, 
Yeah, it's just, well, it's more than that. We're allowing each other into each other's lives. Yeah, you're right. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah. And I don't think I have anything special you do, and I appreciate that. But I do think we all have a story to tell. And if someone's willing to listen, I think that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. I appreciate that. So, um, so yeah, thanks for your time. And I'm, I'm going to tell anybody who's listening or watching, I'm going to add a little bonus audio to the end of this. Uh, Mr. Buskey, I have trouble calling him Mark. <laughs> Tell me to call it Mark, but he's... Get over it. Well, I think your your voicemail on your phone says you've reached Mr. Buskey, doesn't it? It says Mr. B, actually. Mr. B, oh, the well. The kids started calling me Mr. B 30 years ago, okay. and I never dropped it. There you go. Um, so, you know, your, your voicemail says Mr. B. Okay, okay, fair enough. Right. So, uh, anyway, you weren't my teacher, but that's what I... <laughs> So we actually had a conversation out on this back patio here yes. three or four days ago. Um, and I'm going to put some of that conversation on there because that conversation was about why I'm, why I'm doing this. Yes. You know, what has motivated yeah. me to do this? And we, we, we kind of meandered a little bit off the yeah, more Star Wars discussion, of course, because um, it's important. It's, it's very, very important. <laughs> it's always important, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, it's actually kind of a, a and, and you'll hear from the bonus, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that bonus audio at the end of this, so you're going to hear it after this, so stay tuned for a few minutes, <laughs> um, and it'll give you an insight as to why I started doing this very recently, and, and what's motivated me, and, and Star Wars is a part of that adventure. Um, and then, if you're watching or listening, I'm really glad that Mark shared a story with us. Because I've known you for a long time, and I knew hardly any of this. You know, you know, you just you work with somebody, and I'm your kid's teacher. Yeah, you know, and I loved having parents become friends, but we still had a professional relationship. Uh, you know, some of these kids have now grown up, as Matthew has, and a lot of the parents have not, and I have now become very good friends, and I appreciate that they become family for me over here. Um, but you know, when you're in that professional setting, we were doing the right thing. I know we get to. What would you say earlier? We're getting married next year, something like this. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, Jennifer. Uh huh. Um, so am I. So the. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that. So we, you went on the trip to New York with us, right? Yes, that's true. So there's a high school trip with New York. Yeah. I think you were a, a big impact on Matthew's life when he was in middle school because that's kind of when you start to you start to discover who you are a little bit, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And and that was when he really started to develop a, a love for music, and he has his mom's musical talent. Yes. Um, I, I can carry a tune, but I'm better at performing it while I'm carrying it than you don't want me to stand up and sing. You want me to act. It, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, which means I'm going to be I'll I'll sing I just, <laughs> I'll sing Shapoopy, <laughs> but I <laughs> I won't sing. Uh, uh, well, there were bells. I'm not singing, you know, yeah. the, pr the pretty songs. The pretty songs, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I think you were, you were an early influence on Matthew's life and a big reason why he is now choosing to have a career in music and yeah. why I was majoring that in college. It's so, amazing. Yeah, it's, it, and so take our, and I think you've got a lot of that going on. It's, a, it's been a really good... Um, the, the Zoom Up South kind of funnel, I guess, from middle school through oh high school. Oh my gosh, we did have drama. Um, we had yeah. great teachers in, in music, in, in band, in orchestra, and yeah. drama at the middle school. And then right up to the, those guys at the high school picked up and uh, whew, we were cranking us some kids, and they still are. Yeah. So stay tuned. We're, we'll have another, <laughs> I don't know, 15 minutes after this, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and. Also, if you know somebody with a story, as you can see with with uh, with Mr. Buskey here, uh, doesn't always have to be something dramatic. I've talked to I've talked to people who have had childhood brain cancer. I've also talked to an old friend of mine who's been an actor his whole life. I'm I'm just looking for stories. Let's just tell our stories. There's no reason why we can't get together and spend somewhere between forty five minutes and an hour and a half telling someone's story, there and then uh, I guarantee all of our stories can inspire others. Uh, make somebody feel good at a downtime, or just help us feel good about each other because we've all got unique and creative stories. So please let me know about those stories. You can look me up on Facebook. It's Dirk Pointer. Or if you're watching on YouTube, put something in the comments. I'll look you up. And um, that's really all i got. Need your stories? Bring them to me. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Buskey. Thank you, Mr. Pointer. All right. We'll be talking soon. Cut. <laughs> yeah. I was like, got to have a moment there, right?
we'll talk about it here. All right, fair enough. Okay, I'm going to put it right here. So, um, when did I start the podcast? Yes. So, I've, I've had a thought and a desire in me for a long time, probably over a decade, to, like, record the stories of my family. Um, and I was able to do that. I got, I met with my grandparents, got about an hour and a half of their, mm -hmm. their life story, um, with both them, before, a couple years from my grandma, before my grandmother passed away. And after bugging my dad for years, because he was in, um, Vietnam and he actually was stationed in Thailand running missions over, uh, Cambodia when it, when they weren't being run Yes. at the end of the war. And... I didn't know that until he finally agreed to sit down and talk to me about three years ago. Those guys are very rarely did. Yeah, right. You know, they came back and they didn't say anything. Yep. Um, and I was fortunate that he agreed to do that. And I think I know why, because he, he has vascular dementia. And so now you can't really have a conversation with him. Right. I, but he knew it at the time and, and didn't tell us, never told us he had a heart condition. I don't know if you know about vascular dementia at all. or I don't know, no. Um, it's it's actually plaque build up in your arteries that breaks off and stops in your brain because that's where your smallest blood arteries are. They're that small, but it's just mini, miniature strokes over time. Oh, wow. Um, and so small that you may not notice what's going on to the point that we've noticed a deterioration in it for probably about a decade. And um, it was probably happening the whole time, just small strokes here and there, here and there. And so he agreed to do that about three years ago. And this last year is when it got, he got to the point where he has dementia. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate it. But, you know, it, it is what it is. And, and we've been, now it's just something we deal with. And, it, you know, I get, again, I don't want to feel cold saying that, but. No, you know, we you... saw dad begin to decline when he hit 80. And he was finally diagnosed as dementia. We didn't really notice any severe change in behaviors with him until he was a, about 81. Of course, he died just a few months later. Mm -hmm. But really, we just saw tiny steps, kind of like you're seeing with your dad. And um, I started doing the same thing you're doing, except I started getting it on paper, writing down his stories. Thank goodness he'd already started before I tried to finish them off. So I've got a whole book full of his memories on paper. Plus, as you've seen me posting on Facebook, I've started writing down his stories by trying to pull up his voice in my head yeah. and then getting him on getting him down. That's great. And and I I've been reading your stories and they're they're fun, you know? It's and it's like I just like hearing people's stories. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I find it fascinating and and and, and I don't need a 34 ch page chapter on some incident that occurred, but I'm looking for, you know, 250 words on a little thing that happened and then try to find a way to relate it to other folks. And my biggest goal is if somebody sees the same thing in their own life, yes. you know, if I strike a memory for them and they write me a note back on Facebook that says, hey, that same thing happened to me or I've got a similar story, I'm thrilled. I don't care whether or not they think I'm cute. <laughs> I already know I'm not cute. My goal is for them to look back on their own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that that was, that that's, uh, we're, very, we're basically 100% similar there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. And... So I had, so I did that with my family and, and, and I was happy to get those and I've still got more people to get and I, I feel bad. I didn't sit down with my father-in-law and he passed away last June. Oh, um, sorry. So yeah, so that I, I wish I, I wish I'd done that. Right. There was also a lady at work and, and I met her. I've been at, I've been at my employer for eight years. So I met her, I've known her the whole eight years or I knew mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was an African American lady and I found out that she had grown up in Kentucky in the fifties and sixties through desegregation, and her dad owned a farm in Kentucky. Hmm. Yeah, and I talked to her a little bit, and, and she talked about, she talked more about the, the deseg and her brother getting beaten up at school. And, sure. Um, and, and some of the challenges, not a lot, but you know, I know that she's been through real serious tribulations, you know, and, and, I, and I really think back to her dad owning a farm in the middle of um, Kentucky in that time period, and I can't imagine what they went through. Oh, no. Yeah. So I had always thought I would love to get together with her and, and do a podcast or, or just record her story. So sure, maybe, sure. maybe and just give it to her so she has it for her family. And I didn't do it. And she passed a couple years ago. She got cancer. It was very fast. And and I regretted that, but it kind of just left my mind, you know, uh -huh. and it wasn't, it wasn't like, 
like I wish I had done that, you know, and I and and I wish I had done these things. I wish I just started up talking to people, and I didn't. So I have this. I have a friend, an online friend that I I met through playing Star Wars. I play a Star Wars game on my phone. <laughs> See, <laughs> hey, we are all just big kids. Exactly. Star Wars brings us together. Uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I should not tell you. Uh, because we're close in age, but I'm a little older. Um, Star Wars movies came out, you know, when I was in, coming up through middle school and high school. Uh-huh. I didn't see them. I'm a farm kid. We didn't go to the movies. Yeah. So when I retired four years ago, I finally saw the Star Wars movies. <laughs> I'm just now catching up with yeah. that whole generation's worth of films that I didn't have time for, or we didn't spend the money on things like that, or it just wasn't available because it was a half an hour just to drive into town. Now, yep. did, did, now you know, Star Wars did you know Darth Vader was Luke's father before you yeah, saw Well, it? there's some spoilers that were okay. going to, you know, that was 37 years ago. Um, so, yeah, I, I knew. Okay. It was still kind of a neat moment when I finally saw it on screen. Though. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's funny. And I, so I saw Star Wars at the drive-in when I was five. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wait a minute. How far behind are you? I'm 55 now. I'm eight years behind you. Okay. Yeah. So, that's about right. You were in middle school. Yeah. So yeah, we were. It was the first movie I ever saw, at the drive-in, and I remember. I remember the whole experience. I remember that my sister and I wanted. My dad brought a, a paper grocery bag full of popcorn because you know you want to pay for it. <laughs> and my sister and I wanted to sit on the hood of the car and watch the movie and eat the popcorn. Yeah. But then we realized we couldn't hear it because the speaker is up at the window of the car, so we had to get back in the car. Sure. I remember taking a bath bathroom break during the trash compactor scene. I remember the whole experience. <laughs> It was that impactful on me, and then I so I started buying figures. I had saved up money, and I think the figures were a dollar at the time. Oh, sure. And that was a new thing, actually. You know, t- oh, small yeah. action figures. Yeah, that was a whole whole new market. Yeah, and so I first two I bought were C three PO and Darth Vader, and then I've just been hooked ever since. Um, so, yeah. I, I only have a tiny similar story in the fact that I saw Jurassic Park at a drive-in theater. Because I couldn't get a ticket anyplace else. Wow. So we're literally lying on the hood of the car watching this giant screen. And, of course, when the first movie came out, that was huge. And the movie was huge on the screen. And so the dinosaurs were huge. But the sound was tinny and tiny and small. <laughs> so I had to go back and see it a second time in a real theater to get the real experience. Yes. It Still, it was, it was pretty... Uh, it was overwhelming, kind of watching the dinosaurs, you know, on that giant screen. I remember that. I remember that too, because the, the special effects didn't do that. No. Yeah, that was a brand new thing that a dinosaur could look like a dinosaur. Yeah. Yes. And not a claymation yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah drive-ins yeah. are going through a, a renaissance right now because yeah, yeah it's yeah. the thing to do again. Right. And thank goodness, uh, there's a Skyview in Belleville. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's still there, which is where I saw. Since I'm an Illinois kid, that's where I saw Jurassic Park. Too. Yeah. Pretty funny. <laughs> So anyway, so I, yeah. I, I was, <laughs> and I, <laughs> that's fine. And I'm friends with this guy on, uh, online and we, we actually have become, you know, as, as, as real of a friend as you become with somebody you don't have any contact with. Right. right. So, uh, somebody described it to me yesterday as you're, you're like new friends all the time. You're like, you know, you're always, you're, there's distance, but you, you're still friends. And so we actually had followed each other on Facebook and I saw that his wife was pregnant because she posted something on his post. Mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, is your wife pregnant? Or did you have a baby? And he said, no. And I'm like, well, she was a surrogate. Oh. And so my brain lit up imme- like immediately. And I'm uh-huh. like, okay. So I wanted to tell stories and here we go. And, yeah. and for me... And she was my first podcast. She's she's okay. out there right now. You can and I, I, I can send you the link. And um, such a great story. She just talks about why she did it and the process. And they still are in touch with the couple, and they know the girl. Okay. Even though they're not genetically related, right? They they, they maintain a relationship, and that's a new thing. I'm going to talk to an adopted family that they knew as well. That they they all keep in touch okay um which is not how it used to work oh no no the opposite was everything true. was a secret yeah right um so that kind of got me lit up and i think i think it's where i am in life i i so to tell my story a little bit more and, and yeah. sorry i'm getting into me here but 
I, I have a BA. It's really all about you, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It, that's what it always comes down to. <laughs> um, I got my BA in theater, mm-hmm. and I don't think I really knew what I wanted to do until within the last five, five to eight years, somewhere mm-hmm. in that range. Mm-hmm. I went back and got my MBA, and I, I really enjoy managing and, and developing and working with people. And so I think that that comfort level of who I am and what I like doing and just doing it, it took me a lot longer than some people to get there. Yeah. Um, but at 47, when her, when I found out that she was a surrogate, I'd had this thing on my mind for a long time and not done it, I just said, well, let's just do it. Sure. And so I'm... I'm four into the podcast. I've got my fifth one recorded, and I'm gonna. It'll. And I just published my sister's story last night and yesterday. And I'm gonna. I'll be creating a group on Facebook and inviting a bunch of people that have had, you know, that are. Yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, and I'll. I'll be doing that. Um, I'm kind of feeling this out as I go, and I'm not looking for fame and fortune. You know, what I've been telling everybody is at at the minimum level. You have something that's recorded for posterity for your friends and family. There you go. At a at a maximum level, you can impact some lives, and and that's it. Mm-hmm. Whatever happens after that is just happens, you know. And so, if if I can do this for whatever period of time and keep finding people, because that's the challenge I'm finding is, I have a limited circle of people I know, but then it seems like I hadn't thought of talking to you at the beginning, but I saw your your stories on Facebook and I had read through them I'm like you know you have a unique experience with life maybe not unique but you know what I'm saying it's a, I know what you're saying yeah yes. and I thought it would be interesting to talk to you for those very reasons so all right 